on yet. Um, but it's um, I didn't I didn't I wasn't the translator. I was the editor. Okay. So somebody. So how many of you know about Hank the cow dog? So Hank the cow dog. Hey hey. So T O D. Were you back there? Are you hiding back there? Oh, am I? Is the side going? I need, to, I need to get my mic on. Oh, did you see? Did you see the um, the stuff that the Claire did? With her? She's her first thing where she designed everything. Oh. It's over there on the thing. You want to take a look at? So, it's taking a little bit to set up. Um, we have an aisle, which means we're gonna take an offering tonight, <laughs> and I just wanted to and let y'all, and we're gonna take an invitation later too. So. Maybe we can just double, double, like double whammy. You could come forward, rededicate your life to God, and maybe give Him a little something, something Did too. You, you know. The aisle? What? Did you request the aisle? You know, we we figured we we needed it, right? We came in here, we needed it. Um, we were worried about people coming in for the business meeting and everybody just sitting right there by the door. <laughs> and so me and me and Todd and, and JP were in there putting the aisle up together. And this is ultimately, I think that the facilities people. Um, let me put this on so people can hear me.
How about how, how about now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hello? 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 Can't hear me on. Okay. Um. It's on. It's coming through now. Okay, wonderful. Th thank you for calling. You're, you're going to be my, my, web, my webmaster from now on. So. Wonderful. Sounds good. All right. I'll talk to you later. Right. See? Beautiful. Um, that's help. So we had technical difficulties and we solved them. So how many of y'all come to the business meeting? Did you vote on something? Did you get to vote? Like, did you, how many of you like, um, I always wanted to be that guy. I remember going to Baptist business meetings growing up. I want to be the guy who just fought over everything over. <laughs> I noticed in the minutes that it says Pappas barbecue. And I don't remember having Pappas barbecue. I think we had uh, Pappas burgers for the, for the thing. So I'd like to, I'd like to have the notes amended and have, have, the, have the minutes reflect that. So, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, I just want. There's always that one guy, right? And so I want not not. So because that there's the rule. There's a there's a saying, right? The fights are so bitter because the stakes are so small. So um, but no, I, uh, but no, I did. I did. That's why what what Pastor Ryan said there at the end. I've always wanted to be at a committee where I got to to second something. I second that, and because I don't know why, just the power of the the the. I move that we accept this. Is there, are there any seconds? Uh, y y yes. <laughs> it's power. But anyway. Uh, anything else going on when you talk about? Election? What? Oh, oh, no. We are not talking about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it reverse. <laughs> so it is, it is crazy. Like, like, the truth is, you know, that's one of those things where you, you realize how much politics has become people's religion, right? Like, I, I, I thought a lot about this, and it's like, it's, you should be involved in politics, you should care, you should, you should have a voice, you should. But the truth is, um, what does a religion do? A religion tells you what sin is, what, what the ultimate sin is, and what you have to do to be free from that sin, and who's going to solve it. It gives you a picture of sin, and what repentance looks like, and who the Messiah is. And, I don't know, I... I it just, like, it's, it's always one of those. And what's the, what's the definition of a fanatic? Someone who won't change their mind and can't change the subject. And so it's like, it's like I, hate, I guess I, I spent so many, so many years in a university where I was um, bombarded by people who wanted to change my mind but weren't willing to, to open up their own mind as well. Like the whole premise of an argument, right? You are not, you are not actually having an argument or an actual discussion with somebody if you don't give them what you expect from them, which is willingness to consider other points of view. So we just like to, we're, you know, we're just, anyway, I can, get, I can get started on this, but don't get me because I'll get mad and I'll start, start, start yelling and maybe crying too. So <laughs> sobbing, rocking uncontrollably back and forth. It just, it hurts. So, um, so you're not going to use a microphone the whole time? <laughs> I will if you want me to. You mean you just, I will use the mic. I will use the mic. I will use the mic. There you go. Then yes, I will use the mic. I don't. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. Let's try. I have to wear two mics. What? Yeah. Exactly. So hello. Mute. No. How about now? How better? Beautiful. Okay. Is anybody, can anybody not hear me who wishes to hear me? <laughs> so I am so confused right now. Um, anyway, but now we are in the, given how the Texans are doing, we're in, that, we're in the long, drawn out, uh, dark winter of no sports worth watching, right? Because, like, are any, are, ha, any football fans left? The, the, how many, anybody root for a team other than the, the Texans? Aggies. What? Aggies. Oh, that's adorable. I always love hearing Aggies. They're just, they're so cute. They're just, they're just cute. I just love them. 
just because they're so optimistic no matter what, right? They just, <laughs> I wish I had their optimism. I just want to hug them. I just, oh, I love you guys. I, so, uh, I, I get, I, I've told you, I give Aggies a hard time, but the truth is I, I did almost go to A&M. Then I realized I had a high school education, so I just, <laughs> I just figured I'd, I'd leave it at that. So, um, no, I, I learned, I learned to fight them. Be, I, I learned to, how to antagonize Aggies well because uh, when I lived in Austin, the church I was at there um, was full of engineers, right? Aggie engineers there, and the Aggies that live in Austin, man, those are serious Aggies, right? Those are like Shia Aggies, and and they're, <laughs> and they're, <laughs> and they're just like super intense about it, and so you. And man, you, they can't, they can't take a joke. They're all, anytime you, I grew up telling Aggie jokes, right? And the, the chief part is Aggie jokes are there always there, just kind of, Aggies are just furring their brow in a vain attempt to understand. And it just makes me, no. <laughs> See, there you go. See, there's a, um, no, I'm just, I'm just jealous because we, I, I went to, to Baylor um, at a time when, I, I got both ends of the Aggie rivalry, right? So I, I we always wanted to, beat a and but never actually succeeded in doing it. So it makes me sad. Because ba Baylor was good for like two years, and now they're back to wandering in the wilderness. So, um, all right, well, let's open up in prayer, and then we will dive into our study. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the fact that it, um, it lives out what, what Paul says the church is. It's held together by what every joint supplies. Thank you for the business meeting and for one, uh, people who are able to run this church so effectively and manage all of the different details and to do it um, so well. Thank you for all the ways in which it reflects people who just believe in the mission and vision of the church and pour into it and, um, and support what is going on and want to be a part of it. Father, as we open your word, I pray that you would uh, speak to us, transform us. Uh, help us to hear something we need to hear so that we can be the people you desire us to be so that we can do the things you want us to do in this world. Help us to be different because we were here tonight. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, we are in 1 Corinthians, and we are going to be in a study. Uh, today, we're going to finish up. We didn't get all the way through chapter 6 last night. Last time, we're going to try to finish up chapter 6 and then go into chapter 7. Um, to remind ourselves, that the, the st our study is called... You know, um, one spirit, one body, one Lord. And the whole idea is to try and get people to realize the unity we're supposed to have because, of, uh, because we're followers of Jesus. You know, one of the frustrating things is how fragmented. The good news is, the bad news is, the American church is incredibly fragmented. Um, the good news is, it's nothing new. You know, this happens all the time. And the reason why is because the things that, the things that pull us apart now are the things that have always pulled the church apart because the church is supposed to be a body of a body of people that the world says doesn't belong to each other, that doesn't belong together, that it doesn't look like the world. Um, they got to preach, you know. Pastor Ryan did a great job preaching here on Sunday. I did. A, I was up at North Katy talking about um, talking about this, a similar subject about politics, and and I was just saying, look, I, I, I we talked from First Corinthians one about the division that's in the church then. It's it's in the church now. Why? Because the church has always been a group of people that were made of different socioeconomic groups, different ethnicities, different philosophies. The world, the stuff they brought in from the world was at conflict, but the thing that united them was Christ. And, that, and Paul continually has to remind them, that's not your main identity. Stop seeking your main identity in those other things. Seek your main identity here. That's why it's, it's, it's helpful to say, um, to remind us what I said before, like, uh, you know, who, what do you think your identity is? What are the things you run home to? What do you think will save you? Why, why, why is it good to spot? Yes, be involved in politics, but, but realize that politics is not your savior. Um, that's not your Messiah. The, this isn't going to be, it's, it's important to be involved in the process, but ultimately, where do you look to for hope? What do you think is wrong? What do you think will fix it? You know, um, but you do this with other things too, right? Where do you run to for security and for hope? Where do you run to for fulfillment and promise? Like when you look at the world and say, uh, well, man, this is what's wrong, and if I only had that, then I would be better. Um, well, guess what? That's, that's an idol. That's a religion. That's a god. If I, could just be, if I could be under the protection of that thing, then I'd know I'd have security. And Paul is saying, no, no, learn who you are in Christ. 
and learn to be that and find fulfillment. I, I can't say it enough that one of the things I absolutely love about Kingsland is our mission statement, right? Inviting all people to experience true fulfillment in Jesus Christ, one home at a time. There is not a single person for whom it is, it is, it is not a true statement. The one place you can find fulfillment in this world is by, um, is by following Jesus. It's not saying, of all the different places, try Jesus, see if it works for you. It's, it's literally saying, all those other things are ultimately dead ends, and the only place, the only place that, that, that you can find joy and peace and happiness and fulfillment is here, that's, la that's lasting. Um, we ended last week by talking about, um, you know, some pretty heavy subjects about, about, you know, sin. And we talked about one of, the, one of the big ones that we looked at was at the end of 1 Corinthians 6 in verses 9 through, through 11, where he simply says, look, don't be deceived. The immoral are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. The people who, live in, who, who don't fight against sin, not that we don't all stumble into sin, but the people who think that sin is good and celebrate, this is not going to lead you to the, the righteousness and peace that God wants you to have. Um, but then he also says, he lists a whole bunch of sins, some that we exalt in our society as the worst sins of all, and some that we... Um, don't pay enough attention to. But, but the main point, I think, um, is verse 11 in verse chapter 6. But such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that God takes what the world breaks and makes it new again. And that's something to remind ourselves of, right? That, that, the, that the world wants to label you by your sin. The world wants you to say, this is who you are, and because of that, you are hated and you are worthless. And um, one, the, the, the promise is God never sees you as your sin. God sees you as the person He created you to be and He loves you so much He wants you to be free from it. In fact, His wrath is poured out on your sin because He hates it so much out of His deep, deep love for you. And then one of the most amazing promises um, in the whole Bible comes at the very end in Revelation 21 where, uh, where uh, the, John gets a vision of the new heavens and the new earth and he says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, I make all things new. Not, I will make all new things, but I will make all things new. God will take every single thing that's broken in this world and fix it. There will not be a single place where sin, death, evil, and injustice will be allowed to have the last word. So... Glorify God with your body now. Serve Him now, right? And so we, we ended last week talking about like all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but I will be mastered by, uh, but not be mastered by anything. We talked about the difference between sin and encumbrance. There are certain things that are that are wrong for everybody all the time to do, and there are other things that it might not be wrong for everybody, but it's something that's keeping you from being the best version of yourself. It's weighing you down. It's encumbering you. It's not helping you run with endurance the race that's set before you. Um, he goes on. There's, tonight's lesson is going to be a little bit tricky because it's going to be very epistle-y. Epistle is just the word for letter. And, uh, and uh, uh, we forget that Paul isn't writing a sermon or a book. He is writing an, an occasional letter to a specific group of people. Imagine how, like now, you, you get, when you send a text message, you get your text and the other person's text. So if I found your phone, I could follow the conversation. Imagine if somebody only had your text messages and was trying to reconstruct the other half of a conversation. That's kind of what's going on here. They had written him a letter. So two things are going on. Chloe's people had come to tell him some problems that were going on, and some people had written Paul a letter asking them specific questions. He is going to start addressing those questions tonight, and so sometimes it's going to be weird because we don't, we don't have their, their side of the story so far. Um, but let's look at, starting in verse 13 of chapter 6. I want to start with, um, well, let's read. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has, only, has not only raised up the Lord, but He will also raise us up through His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. So flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So verse 13 starts off with probably one of those questions. Food is for the stomach and stomach is for food. Like basically there, there, was, a, there was a certain group of people in Corinth that were, um, had a bad view of the body. And they basically said this. Um, it, if you ever hear me talk about the platonic view of the world, here's what Plato said. Plato said um, the physical world of corruptible, decaying flesh, bad. The spiritual world that's eternal, that's good. And they like to talk about a platonic uh, view of world. It's called dualism, that, that the spiritual world is wonderful and the physical world is terrible. Um, and it doesn't really matter and it's unimportant. And this caused two d distinct opposite errors that Paul actually has, has to address in, in this chapter and the start of the next one. Some people thought the spiritual world is all that matters. Therefore, nothing physical is worth doing. We're just going to be monks, we're going to go pray all the time, and we're just going to think about eternal thoughts, and we're not going to enjoy our life. Because all that, all that physical pleasure is terrible. It's actually a term called asceticism, if you ever want to know the term for it. The, other di the ditch on the other side of the road is, if God's going to give me a new body anyway, or destroy this body, or what I do in this body doesn't matter, I can live it up all the time. I can do whatever I want. Because it doesn't matter what I do, because the whole purpose of it is, I've been saved, and my spirit's going to go be with Jesus one day, and so if I ruin this body, who cares? Both of those he addresses by saying, look, God cares about your body. God cares about this world. Um, God created this physical world. He created it for you to enjoy. And one of the greatest, most powerful pictures of that is the resurrection. Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. He's going to talk about this later in 1 Corinthians 15 where he defends the resurrection, where he says Christ's, Christ's body wasn't immaterial. It wasn't spiritual. It wasn't, it wasn't non-physical. You could touch Jesus, right? That's what Thomas does, right? Touch my, touch my body. If anything, he was more than physical. He was more physical than you or me. Um, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that says, Our corruptible flesh must put on immortality put on incorrupt, not take it off. Like a, a, a platonic philosopher would say, our corruptible flesh must be shed so that our spirit can go uh, live in the spiritual world. No. The biblical picture of the, God, the relationship of spirit and matter is this. God created everything in this world as good. Okay? God loves our bodies so much and wants us to honor, them with, honor, honor Him with them. It's so much so that He raised Jesus from the dead bodily. And so, and as Christ is, we will be too. It's one of those weird things that you can't really convince somebody. If I said, what is the hope of Christianity? Most people would say something like, um, it's to go to be with Jesus when you die. That is true, but it is not the whole story. The whole story is the ultimate hope of, of, of Christianity is the new heavens and the new earth, the complete, the complete fixing of all the problems in the world, and ultimately for you, resurrection. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4 that most people turn to when they're looking for, for talk about the rapture. Um, but actually, 1 Thessalonians 4 is actually about the resurrection. People, are in, people in, in Thessalonica were dying. And like, did they miss the resurrection? What's going on? Can they experience it? And, and he, what he says is he tells us, he says, I, don't, I don't want you to be, 1 Thessalonians 4 starting in verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be deceived about those who are asleep so that you will grieve like those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that when He returns, He'll bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. So where are those people who have fallen asleep? They're with Jesus. So to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. When you die, you will go to be with Jesus. The New Testament is full of those promises. right? I, it's one of those things that I, I always try to find common grounds with other denominations of Christianity. But truth be told, it's one of those things that has to be reinforced. There is nothing in the, from the words of Jesus or from the pages of the New Testament to support any view other than to be absent from the body means to be present with the Lord. Some people believe in ideas of purgatory and things like that. It's simply not in Scripture. Um, he told, Jesus told a thief condemned to die on the cross next to him that on that very day he would be with him in paradise. There, you, don't, you don't have to pay for your own sins. The whole message of Christianity has been done for you. Um, but so Paul says, those who have died are with Christ. 
And when he returns, he'll bring with him those who have fallen asleep and the dead in Christ will rise. That's the coolest thing about that passage. We miss it by trying to make it about the rapture. It's about the second return of Jesus. And he is going to bring with him all of those people who, have, who, who are with him, who, who have died. And when he does, they are going to rise from the dead. It's a complicated picture. So where are they? They're with Jesus, and their bodies are going to rise, and it's going to be a, a cool reunion. It's one of the reasons why Christians have traditionally buried instead of cremated. Some pe people have asked me these questions, um, and they're not, again, this is not saying, a lot of people, uh, funeral expenses are so expensive these days, a lot of people do it for, uh, do cremation just for the cost benefit. There's no, there's not like any rules, like God can't put the pieces back together again later on. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but the reason why is because it's a symbol, traditionally. Um, Christians believe that the body is, God loves the body and will raise the body up. Okay? And so we, we, it's a symbol that we await the resurrection. Cultures that believe, like the Platonic view, that your body is, is bad and physical and decay and we've got to free your spirit up to go, like the Romans, the Romans uh, burned, cremated, because they were trying to liberate the spirit from the decaying flesh. So you see, it, it's a picture. Like a friend of mine who was going to write a book, he was going to try and talk about how the, you know, cremation is a bad symbol and burying is a good symbol of what, what, Christian, what the ultimate Christian hope is. He was going to call the book, Don't Make an Ash of Yourself. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but it's okay. Like, but all that to say, people, a lot of people have asked me about what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach anything about it. Okay, do what you are prone to do, what you feel more com most comfortable with. Um, you don't have to worry either way. This is one of those matters of conscious, conscience things. Do as you feel led to do, okay? Um, and so, but yeah. Uh, but it, it's a picture, it, 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 it needs to be underscored. What you do in this body matters. God loves you, God loves your body, and, and he will raise it up one day. And so that's what he's talking about here. Some people in Corinth were evidently saying, it doesn't matter if I drink a lot. It doesn't matter if I, I overeat. It doesn't matter if I go see temple prostitutes because it's just my body. And he says, no, what you do with your body matters. He says it for two reasons. He says, one, um, uh, when you join with a prostitute, you, you're sinning with your body. But guess what? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're taking Jesus with you. Right? The two reasons why he says you should be careful what you do with your body is, one, your body is a, tw is a temple of the Holy Spirit, a place where God, um, a God is present, and now you're going to go take that and go sin? That's the first reason. The second reason, he says, is because you don't belong to yourself. This is an important question. This is an important thing that we have to sort of get out there. Who has authority over you? Who has the ability to command your obedience? Whom do you belong to? Um, to be honest, I mean, it's a pretty stark, stark phrase. And it would be just as stark then as it is now. Verse 20, um, verse, end of 19. <laughs> you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Um, you belong, to, uh, you belong to, to God is stark. There's a place where Paul, uh, it gets translated as bondservant or servant in other places. Paul uses the word doulos, which means slave. You have been bought with a price. Um, and to realize, um, ask yourself right now, who has the ability to tell you what to do? Americans are crazy, stupid, fiercely independent. No one's going to tell me what to do. We'd rather take our ball and go home, right? We looked last week. Why not rather be wronged? Um, who has the right to tell you what to do? That's actually a, the greatest picture. That's the best answer to how you can figure out what you ultimately fear. We're told to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? What you fear in this world is the thing that you most want to please, least want to disappoint, the thing that has the right to compel your obedience. It would be your boss. For some people, like there's a place in, in Philippians where Paul talks about people whose God is their stomach. Some people do whatever their stomach tells them to do, their appetites. And so they're slaves to, to their appetites. Whatever they feel like doing, that's what they do. It's their God. It has the right to command their obedience. I guarantee you, there is something that, that, you, that you have the default trump card over everything else. 
he says, do you realize you belong to Jesus? Um, and therefore, <laughs> glorify God with your body. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a tough thing to realize, tough thing to, to reorient ourselves to, but it's, it's absolute fundamental, fundamental. What you do with your body matters. There's, now, there's a phrase in verse 18 that some people mistake. Um, it says, free immorality, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Again, this is not, most of these aren't um, grand eternal statements. He's talking to a specific problem in Corinth. What this means is a lot of people were saying the real sins are the ones that, um, that happen outside the body, like pride or hate or jealousy. Like we talked about the sins of the, of the devil, right? The spiritual sins. There are sins that you can do without using your body. Um, and he was going, no, no, this is bad too because you're actually sinning with your body. All the other sins happen outside your body, but this one you actually do with it. He's not saying this is the only sin that you sin against your body. You think about gluttony hurts your body too. But he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to just underscore the fact to a person in Corinth that what you do with your body has real consequences. I can't convince my kids of this, right? Um, my kids think the phrase, it was an accident, ex exonerates them from all, all blame. <laughs> like, it was an accident. It still hurt, right? Like, like, this person's still bleeding, right? You still, what you did, you might not have done it on purpose, but what you did still provoked some sort of, um, yeah, problem. Question so far? He goes on. I, I really wish I could cover all of seven, but we're stupid business meeting. Um, <laughs> all of seven uh, is, seems to be the beginning of him writing, responding to what they wrote. Look at verse seven one. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That is not Paul's writing. It is good for a man not to touch a woman is the question that they had. This is the one wonderful thing about ancient texts. There are no punctuation marks. There are no spaces. How cool was this? Ancient writing was written in all capital letters, no spaces or punctuation. And so it's, all that stuff was added later. If I had my chalkboard, I could show you the origin of the, of the, um, the question mark. It's pretty cool. Hey, if you ever go to the, the Dunham Bible, you've been to the Dunham Bible Museum down at HBU? They, you can learn about where uppercase and lowercase came from. Fascinating stuff. Um, this is their question. So what about marriage? Should, is marriage? Is marriage a big deal? Because there were some people who weren't taking marriage serious at all because what I do in the body doesn't matter. I can just sleep with whoever I want. And other people were saying, we're too spiritual for something as messy as marriage, right? Let us just only think and pray and, we, what we, and let's, not, let's not take these relationships all that, all that seriously. And Paul is going to walk that middle ground and give us some clear pictures about how to address marriage in a biblical way. But it's important to, to realize that he is talking to specific people with specific questions about specific problems. And we're going to have to do a, a very important process that here, you don't, sometimes you don't have to use uh, very often, but it's a sound biblical principle that maybe you don't know. So when you read a phrase that says, um, thou shalt not kill, okay, that means thou shall not kill, right? It just mean, it means kind of everything. It actually means, the word actually means murder, and we can talk about what difference between murder and killing, but it's kind of clear for everybody. But sometimes certain phrases are rooted in such specific contexts that you have to begin, you have to use a process called then, always, now. You have to ask yourself, what did it mean in that context? We'll see it next time, definitely, when we talk about meat sacrifice to idols. I don't, anyone have access to meat sacrifice to idols right now? I don't. <laughs> and so what, is he, what did it mean then? Now, what is the always eternal truth that, 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 and then how does that apply to us now? So then, always, now. Um, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immorality, each man is to have his own wife, and each man is to have her own husband. One of the coolest things that's going to go on here is you're going to notice it. It might sound weird. He's going to say some pretty startling and staggering things. But one of the coolest things is that would be an absolute gong in the ears of ancient Christians. Whatever burden he places on the woman, he places on the man equally. In the ancient societies, um, there were some places that saw... 
um, women as wives as the property of their husbands. In fact, there are still some laws in America that, that I find it amazing that there are certain places where um, people still advocate for the fact that they try to claim that it is not possible for a husband to rape his wife. Do you realize this? Because they're married. He can do what he wants. He owns. They, they, it's bizarre. But think about what that means. A woman could never, in, in America, there's still places where this is, this is the case. A, um, a wife cannot accuse her husband of rape. It's in, legally, it's impossible. There are people who believe that because of the ways in which they see the disparities between husbands and wives. In the, in the ancient world, one of the chief arguments for homosexuality was the fact that men saw women as something that you um, used to have children with, but not your equal. You couldn't have a real relationship with a woman because she wasn't your, a man, another man was your intellectual equal. Um, and Christianity came in and goes, no, God, God made them male and female and they equally reflect the image of God. Eve was made out of Adam's rib, not out of his head that she, that she would rule over him, or out of his foot that Adam would rule over her, but out of his side so they could be companions together, equals, co-equals. Every single burden he places on men, he places on women equally in this passage. And that would have been this gong in the ancient world going, no. Um, in fact, there's a place in Colossians where, where Paul says, um, uh, husbands love your wives, and wives, see to it that you respect your husbands. And it's weird. It sounds like they're not responding for the same thing, but the truth is they are. What the husbands need to hear is this is not somebody to order around. And no, you're, you're required to love. There is an emotional side to this. And evidently in the, in the Christian world of Colossae, men, women were like, no, I'm equal. I don't have to listen to you. And they had used their, their equality with men as a means to not show respect, mutual respect to one another. Equality. So each one is supposed to have his own wife. Each woman is supposed to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now, every ancient person would have said, yes, totally, I own you. See that ring? That means I own you. But the second part, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. He just got done saying, you don't, you don't have the right to say what you do with your body because you belong to Christ. He says, and if you're married, you belong to your spouse too, in a real and tangible way. Um, this is a staggering thing, and it might be a little bit hard to hear, but he goes on and says, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is such an integral and important verse. One of his whole premises for um, why marriage is so important is because you were created with biological urges, and one of those, one of the ways in which sin broke us is it distorts our urges and takes them out of, out of their normal boundaries. And one of God's preventative methods for encouraging us to reign in our sexual desires is the institution of marriage. One of the purposes of marriage is chastity. Chastity does not mean, one of the most horrific definitions of chast chastity doesn't mean not having sex. Chastity means not having sex in a time and a place when it's inappropriate for you to do so. So a person is chaste in marriage if they're having sex within the bound of marriage. That's chastity, that's what it means. That's purity, right? We, we have this, there, there's an unwritten uh, background noise of some very bad extreme positions in Christianity that, that treats sex as dirty. It's not. Um, God created sex and it's a wonderful thing. Um, man's desires are inflamed and so, we, so because a lot of people think sex is dirty, we treat um, purity, sexual purity, as something where it only means not engaging in sex is purity. No. I remember hearing somebody say rather crassly at, at a wedding one time, I guess so-and-so won't be pure for much longer. No, they're actually, they're married. They're husband and wife. Sexual purity means engaging in sex in a time and a place when it is appropriate to do so. And one of the chief things right here, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time that evidently sex exists to, maintain, to help maintain. I, there's a lot of reasons we can talk about it. It, it, it creates devotion, it creates reciprocal, um, uh, reciprocal commitment to one another, and it doesn't give Satan an opening. There are ways in which the church has let people down in this regard. Like, you, I don't own you, I can't take from you, you don't own me, you can't take from me, but we need to realize we have a reciprocal commitment to one another. 
um, there is there's a couple of issues in our, in our society where we do a very bad job of encouraging people. You know, you've heard people talk about the, the blatant problems with, with sexuality in American culture, specifically, you know, all the things you can see on the internet, right? Um, and we do a good job of bullying men for the ways they stumble. But one of the weird, I, I don't know how many times I've sat with men over coffee and we talk about uh, this issue that I have, right? People want to talk about, uh, I was told to come talk to you, Steve, because there's this issue and I just don't know what to do about it. And we tell men, we, we heap shame and we browbeat and bully people. But the truth is, I wonder if this verse isn't some, somehow involved. That I, I'll have them talk, like, so what is the cause of all of this? Well, um, not to excuse anything. Sin never is, need, you know, I'm not trying to excuse sin whatsoever. But Paul says here that Satan takes openings, and that opening for, giving, to, for, for tempting people towards sexual sin, that opening is when husbands and wives aren't faithfully committed to each other in sexual relationships. That sexual availability to the other person, sexual openness to the other person, is something that allows for, for um, the enemy to not get a foothold in your relationship. And so what's crazy is the way the church tries to address it, frankly, widens the divide. So think about it. Um, wife catches, maybe in Corinth, it's wife catches husband going to, the, going to the temple of Aphrodite where the temple prostitute is, right? And now withdraws sexually from him. And now his, his out-of-whack sexual urges, now what's going to happen? Just more temptation, more sin. Now, maybe it plays out this way, catches a husband going to a club or looking at some side online that he shouldn't do, whatever. Whatever the broken expression of, of distorted sexuality is, and the, and the, the solution is, is widening the gap, not closing it. Paul says, when husbands and wives aren't committed to each other physically, it creates a divide, and that divide gives Satan an opening to widen that divide even further. Boom. Stop depriving one another except by agreement, except for a time, so that you can devote yourselves to pray, for, but only for a little bit of time. Um, uh, okay, let's, let's roll. Oh, any questions on that? No, it's one of those awkward things you want to talk about. It's like, uh, I remember talking to somebody one time, and I'm just going, I remember saying, so, so why, do you think, why do you think you end up in these situations? And the person had all these reasons to continue to beat themselves up. I think, I mean, I'm not trying to excuse sin or teach people not they shouldn't feel bad about their sin, you should, but like, he was beating himself up over his sin. I'm like, what? And he never asked the question, when does this happen? And um, the truth is, it happened in moments when he wasn't close to his wife. And it just widened that gap. Um, so, I feel like I'm trying to cram too much in right now. Um, um, but this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as myself. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in that. He, say, he says, Paul, Paul evidently wasn't married. He either wasn't married at this time or he'd never been married. Some people think he had been married, but then his, maybe his wife died or something. But he's not married when he writes this, and he go, he's about to say some things that, that make people, f- people feel uncomfortable about singleness. Where he, makes it, he almost makes it sound like it's more spiritual to be single. He goes, no, 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 no. There are some freedoms that I have because I'm single, but each man has his own gift from God. That he realized that it's his own gift. And he's going to say later... Um, um, if they do not have, verse 9, if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. It's better to marry than to burn. Um, one of the purposes of marriage is to, is to bring back in line the distorted urges of, um, of a broken sexuality. So, there you go. Um, let's, can we keep going? Okay, uh, okay. Uh, um, but to the married I give instru- he goes on to say, But to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. Okay, now we get to another thing. Evidently the divorce was pretty common. We are not the first society to, to engage in no-fault divorce. We're not. Um, I can show you how no-fault divorce comes in cycles, and a lot of the problems that we are suffering now uh, pay homage to the fact that in the 70s no-fault divorce was legalized in America. Right, That's when it came due. And you can trace, um, 
Okay, you have, it's a fascinating progression of the way in which our society divorced procreation from sex and then in the process divorced the family. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not here talking about the dangers of, of birth control. I think there are some po- positive benefits they get from it. I think abortion is, is wrong. Um, but, you know, I think that, that um, certain contraceptives can be fine. But what happened, contraceptive birth control pill developed in the 30s and 40s. 30 years later, a generation later, we had the sexual revolution. People, people had divorced sexuality from having babies. And now we're going to have sex with whoever I want, whenever I want, all of the time. That was in the 60s. 20 years later, well, if I can have sex with whoever I want and sex doesn't mean babies, then all of a sudden, I, what is this marriage thing? I should be able to get divorced for any reason I want. That happened in the 70s. The 70s and 80s were all about, about the family. The divorce, marriage can be dissolved for any reason. Flash forward 30 years later, here we are, 2010, and if if marriage can be divorced for any reason, if, if, if marriage can be broken up for any reason, if sex is simply a feeling I get and has nothing to do with children, and to be honest, that's the ultimate distortion of human sexuality. Right now, if I asked you what sex is, most definitions that people would get would be sex is an act I do that gives me a specific feeling, which is a very broken and narrow. It's actually the sexual version, I would say, of bulimia, right? What is the eating disorder called bulimia? It thinks eating is just the physical act of eating, and once I've eaten, then I want to barf it back up because I don't, I don't want the other, I don't want the full gamut of what eating constitutes. And so what happened 30 years after no-fault divorce? If sex is just a feeling, the family doesn't matter, then why can't anybody be married? You, we got mad when, it, when, when, um, when the, the definition of what constitutes family was redefined you know, five years ago. But it was a hundred years coming. It just it it was you could have seen it come. Um, I remember one time doing a, a study on on the Ten Commandments, and people said like if most people think that the, the Old Testament's full of just a bunch of thou shalt nots. Um, if you need to hear it in a positive way, hear this: thou shalt not commit adultery is better summed up this way. Sex is for families. Sex is for families. And, and that has a different, several different meanings, and they're all true. Sex is to be in the context of families. Okay, that's, what it's, that's, that's the environment it's supposed to be in. But also, sex is supposed to produce families. Um, it's supposed, it, it is designed. It is designed to bring husbands and wives closer together. And it's designed to produce the next generation. It is what it's for. To say that, that every one of those things isn't important is like saying eating is just the feeling I get when I consume food. But it's not. I consume food because it nourishes me. I consume food because it's healthy. I consume food because there are other reasons to do it that are all part of the process and purpose and ultimate teleology of eating. We're not the first people to grab a hold of one specific aspect of sex and say this is all that it is. I don't know about you, but I went to school at a time when, we, when they pulled us aside and taught us sex education and health stuff. They, they treated babies as if they were, um, babies as if they were, hey, an accident or a sickness. Don't ruin your life by having this terrible thing called a baby. No. No. Life is always good. It's one of the things I love about Kingsland, right? We, we celebrate adoption. The, the, the situations in which people um, <laughs> come into this world without their choice are sometimes chaotic and dangerous and unfortunate. Um, but life has intrinsic value. Um, you are not valuable because of the contribution you make to society. You are not valuable because um, of, the, of the legacy you leave. You are valuable simply because you are. And so... We have a special needs ministry because, uh, because just because you might have you know, developmental delays does not mean that you are less worth, less valuable to me. Um, we support adoption, adoption ministries and pro-life ministries all across this world because life has value. We're not the first people to distort human sexuality. Um, it's a thing we have to continue to, to realize that it's broken, it's selfish, and the key to fixing it is realizing you don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. And if you're married, you belong to your spouse. 
Um, and that causes a commitment there that, that and asks you whether or not you're glorifying God with your body. And so he says, um, the wife should not leave her husband. So the whole next whole, whole section is about divorce. And again, it's not to, we live in a society that I think for many times brutalize people with divorce. Um, divorce has always been a part of marriage because people, um, people are broken. That's what Jesus said, right? And he did it because of your hardness of heart, because of our sin. Um, it's not to try and excuse it or to make it a reason to hate somebody if they've experienced divorce. One, one of the things I love about Kings and Again is the ways in which we have um, pursued, exalted, and said, look, this is the family, but also this is all the ways that sin breaks the family and trying to pursue redemption and reconciliation in the midst of divorce. I think the biblical picture is this, not that you're evil if you've ever been divorced and not a divorce is okay no matter what. It's simply this. Realize what it is. If the biblical picture of marriage is true and you really are one flesh, then a divorce is less like the breakup of a business partnership and more like the amputation of a limb. Doctors don't like to amputate, but they do it if there's a sickness that's going to cause death, right? And if we saw that, like, I guarantee you, you meet somebody who's had something amputated, they're going to experience it the rest of their life, right? It's going to affect you in ways that, you, that they'll back up on you at other times. Same with divorce. It's not your fault. Even if it's not your fault, even if it's perfectly justified, it's going to feel like an amputated limb. It's going to hurt for a while. It's going it, to, you're going to, um, and if we saw that, then you can realize this is, why, this is why God made this thing called the family and put these rules in place to protect us from that kind of harm. All right, that is enough. Any questions, comments for me? Um, let's pray, and then um, you know, get your kids, go get them, and if not, you can bombard me with questions. Father, thank you for your word. It's so, it's so easy sometimes to read passages like this that have difficult and straight-shooting advice and to feel heavy by it, to feel burdened down by it, to feel lectured to or maybe just exposed by the way that you feel called out by our, um, we feel called out by our sin. Help us to hear this for what it is, Father. It's your straight and honest diagnosis of a deep down disease that every one of us has and which you know about and which you know how to fix. Father, keep us from hiding from you. Help us to completely surrender to you and to show, to realize that when we confess to you, we're not telling you anything you don't already know, but rather agreeing with you that about the disease in our life. Thank you that you made a way for us to be free. Thank you that those, those words in chapter 6 are so true. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were, you were sancti uh, justified by the power of the Spirit. Uh, for all those ways in which we feel hopeless because of our sin, fill us with hope. For all the ways in which we feel shamed by our sin, Father, help us to, to know your love. For all the ways in which we feel trapped by our sin, Father, help us to feel free. Father, all the ways in which our society tries to break, our, break and distort our sexuality and break and distort our family, Father, show us how you made this family for the purpose of protecting and for exalting and for reinforcing and for healing. Heal us, Father. Make us the people you desire us to be. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Any questions for me? I'll draw caricatures on the board later. So, all right, we'll get on up out of here. Depart from me, all ye who practice lawlessness. I've grown tired of you. Mike, I'm glad you, Mike's my new, t I'm going to list him as technical assistant, Mike Kelly, the, the unseen Mike Kelly, the, um, the technical assistant and director. Love you guys. I know, you can't, I, know I can't see you, but I'm, all, all my online people, I love you guys. Mm-hmm.